Hi everyone, hey. welcome to the next episode of uh, Web Analytics with Nick and Nash. That's the thing we're going with. And first, before we get started, we want to thank uh, our good friend Michael for sending us a lovely card. Uh, beautiful, gorgeous, and also sending us two beautiful buttons that say I'm complicated. They were so good, Michael, somebody took them. So we sadly we're going to pose with them, them today, but we don't have them. We have the card, thank you. So all of you, feel free to send us stuff. No? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Let's get going. Um, we've got a series of questions for you, Nick. So let, let's get started. Sure. More technically oriented questions. Um, the first one's from Matt in Ohio, and it says, when will Google implement a better method of testing, try it and wait 24 hours plus doesn't work on a truncated timeline? And so, so that, actually that's a good question. I, it is, yeah. Um, so what, what are the options there? Right, so Google Analytics, you have a piece of JavaScript or, or, or some tracking code that will send data to analytics. And so what you can do, instead of waiting for the reports to process the data, is capture the data that's being sent and ensure that that's valid. So using either uh, Chrome Developer Tools or Firefox uh, has a Firebug tool, you can actually see the request. It's uh, underscore underscore UTM dot GIF, which is the one by one pixel image that we sent to analytics, and a bunch of parameters. And we'll link to a document that describes how you can troubleshoot. That way you don't have to wait 24 hours for the data to process. You can look at it right away and troubleshoot. And that's really the way that uh, advanced users will uh, troubleshoot installations. Exactly. And, and for most people, actually, if not for everyone, the data in Google Antis is processed um, um, are much more faster. So I think publicly it has been stated that the data in Google Analytics will be about an hour old. Just make sure you click on the little uh, clock that mm -hmm. brings on the day reports mm -hmm. and splits it by hours. So um, the data should be at most an hour old. I know that it's actually turned faster than that, but at least right. publicly the commitment is in hours. Uh, but using Chromebug and other developer tools, fantastic, genius, yep. genius idea. Um, the next question also for you, Nick, uh, from uh, Michael in Barcelona. And it says, can you please offer GA.js with gzip compression? Google's own page speed tool gives the alert that GA.js file is not gzipped and it slows down page load, although in a very, 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 very small way. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Uh, so, Nick, um, what's up with this zipping? Yeah, so everything we serve, <laughs> so GA.js is served compressed, gzipped every time. Uh, there is a tool, page speed, that we ha are working with engineers to make sure that they're reporting it properly. Um, but you can be assured that's always GSIP, and you can look at the headers and make sure it's being set that way. So async rocks, and, and if those of you in the video are not using async already, please get on the bandwagon because it does two wonderful things. One is it will collect more data, so your data will be more accurate, plus the loading and back and forth happens really, really fast. So uh, please go ahead. If you're still using urchin.js, jump directly to, to async. async. Yeah, don't use Urchin.js. <laughs> if you're using GA.js, also jump to async right. because it will give you more accurate data. Uh, here's the next question from Ben in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I would like to use set custom var at a visitor level for first touch attribution without losing last touch attribution. To do this successfully, I would need to see if a value exists so I don't know so I don't override it. How might this be accomplished? I don't even know what he's asking for. <laughs> yeah, well, he's asking a lot of questions, but you could uh, actually, for visitor level session variables, um, or for custom variables at the visitor level, we save them in a cookie, and we have a method in our tracking code that you can extract that value. You can oh. see if it's set in track. So we already have it. We'll set a link. You can start doing this. We'd love to hear how it works for you. Exactly. Check out the blog post on analytics.blogpost.com where this video is embedded because mm -hmm. the links are not on YouTube. The links are all on the blog on the post blog, that yeah. we're going to post it. Good, good. Okay. Great. So it looks uh, time for a question for you. This is from Pearl D from the Netherlands. Uh, can annotations be added to analytics automatic through the API or another <laughs> way, for instance, a URL request? When sending a newsletter, for instance, you can make the annotation by the system instead of manually. Oh, that's a very clever idea. Uh, so one of the great things about the team that's doing API um, but, uh, that Nick leads and a bunch of other people are there uh, has actually created an open forum where you can actually go in and rate the features that you find important or the, the things that you want um, the API team to prioritize higher. So in this blog post that goes with this video, we're going to add a link to that particular forum where you can go and vote and make your voice heard, get all your friends to vote for this feature, and boom, it's going to come up. That's right. And with the API, we're really trying to prioritize on what people want. So let us know how this is going to help vote, and we'll uh, help to prioritize. Good. <laughs> Great. Um, the next one's for you as well, Nick. And again, from our friend Michael in Barcelona. Um, why does traffic from Google Images still appear as a referrer instead of a search engine? Uh, so this is a good question. It is, I think, um, yeah. 
and and I think it's it's that you know when I well, I can see in my top referral reports mm -hmm. or referring URLs I can see Google Image mm -hmm. while some people would like to see it under the uh, the search engines report. Right. So the the issue is when you search from Google Images and you click an image, it actually creates a new page hosted by Google and loads your page in an iframe. Ah. So it's not like a standard search. It's slightly different, and that's why it looks like a referral. Uh, there's a couple workarounds that you can do. Um, we'll, we'll link to one solution. Uh, the other way is definitely talk to a GAC or one of our authorized consultants. They can help you out. Um, pretty much what you want to do is if you could identify that the page that's being rendered for your site is coming, that it has a parent page from Google Images, you can overwrite the referral information, set a, a custom search engine, and you can add a new search engine and it will appear as organic. Oh. So there's a couple ways to do it. It's a little complicated for this video. We'll send a link to how some people have done it before. That's very clever, but I could yeah. use it across all search engines, not just Google, to do this wherever you know that kind of behavior is happening. Right, where you're loading in an iframe. Oh, wonderful, okay. wonderful, I like that. Uh, for example, on Twitter, when many people post links, they, it opens this thing on the top, and, and the website is rendered under that uh, particular sort of this toolbar type thing. Okay. I could bust that and use it. As long as it's, yeah, with the iframe, Perfect. yeah, definitely. So it's pretty flexible. Correct. So here's a question for you. This is oh. from uh, Alfire from Montreal. Uh, the traffic source report shows my site as a referral of itself. Why is that? <laughs> uh, good one. Hello, Canada. Um, there are a number of reasons why your website would show up as a self-referrer, uh, but let me just cover two of the most important ones that sort of address 90% of the time that we see this happening. Mm -hmm. And the very first one is that your entire website is not actually tagged. Mm. Especially your key landing pages are not tagged, whether you created them for search engine, email, or whatever. If, if I come to a landing page on your website that does not have the Google Analytics code, um, and I click on a link to go deeper into your website, uh, on which there is actually tracking code, um, to that tracking code, it would seem that this is the first time you entered the website, mm. and you entered the website from this landing page that had no tracking code. Mm. So that's the first most common issue, and make sure that you audit your website frequently enough that all your pages are tagged. So that's number one. In fact, go check the page which you're seeing in self referrer and sure enough, that's a great way to find well, out. Look at the There's no tracking code. Exactly, yeah. Um, the second one that also is very, very common is using redirects of some sort. Mm. And, and what happens is um, you want, uh, let's say you had three pages. So you go from page one to page two to page three, but suddenly you got rid of page three and, and you're actually sending people directly. And, and in this case, you're using a redirect. And we use redirect on landing pages. We use redirect inside the site. We mm. use redirect in many different ways. And what happens then is that if, if the original referrer gets lost. Mm. And if the original referrer gets lost, it looks like the person came from this particular page, uh, from the redirect itself in the middle. So make sure they use permanent 301 redirects, which actually pass the referrer. Mm. The original referrer, not your website URL that referred the person. If you have, an, um, if you don't have, you have a temporary redirect, you will notice that your website has self-referring URL. So those are two of the most common cases why uh, self-referrers happen, and, and it just make sure that you don't have those on your mm -hmm. website. Sounds good. Here's a question for you, Nick, from PPC Guru in Los Angeles, California. And it says, how do you break out the different local Google websites, such as uh, Google.com, Google.com slash ES, Google.co.uk, and things like that. Right. Um, so this whole the question is, can I add a new search engine to Google from the existing ones that we define? And you can. There's a method called Add Organic. We'll send a link to it. And pretty much in the tracking code on every page, you say Add Organic. You put the value Google.com forward slash ES the query parameter, and it'll be a referral as a search. Oh, perfect, perfect. Really and easy. also, on, on, sometimes on websites, uh, somebody has asked me, like, I want to treat business.com as a search engine referrer or something, in which case the same, same method, method works. Exactly. Same method works. Really yeah. flexible. Excellent. All right, so question for you here from uh, Mike FK from Fremont, popular uh, commenter here. Uh, <laughs> the site overlay report is a great tool within Google Analytics, but was wondering why the tool reports the same number of clicks by two same links on a given page. Does this not defeat the purpose of visually analyzing clicks? Yes, yes, and it's a great question. And, and um, as you all know, the site overlay is one of my favorite reports. I think it's, it's great at visually reporting, regardless of the Webantics tool you use. Um, check out the site overlay report in the tools. And this comment that, that um, is coming up is actually common in all Web Analytics tools. Okay. It doesn't actually matter is Google Analytics or not. What happens is, on one page, um, you have two different links. Uh, up here, you have a link 
going to nick.html mm -hmm. and you have another link in the body that's also going to nick.html. Pretty really popular on this page. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what happens is what your web analytics tool, Omniture, Google Analytics, whatever it is, is it, what, what it reports is somebody went from this page to this page. What it doesn't know, the way data gets captured by JavaScript, is that you clicked on this link or this link. It, it doesn't know. Um, and when it doesn't know, it displays um, both of the, the data in both of those places. So there's a very simple fix to this in any web analytics tool you use. And what you do is you make them distinct. And so what happens is, in this particular link, when I uh, uh, link to nick.html, I'm going to add a query parameter. And then I'll say sc equal 1, because that's the link on the top. Mm -hmm. And the second one, I'll, it, I'll add an, a parameter to it, nick.html uh, parameter sc equal 2. And now to your web analytics tool, these two links have become distinct. Mm -hmm. They are not the same link, even though they point to the same page. So adding this kind of query parameter is one method by which you can teach the search engine that these are two different links. It's a very common method that is being used to overcome the challenge of site overlay in any web analytics. That sounds pretty thing. simple. So something that very you simple fix. Do. Great, great. Um, here's Andy from San Diego. Nick, a okay. question for you. Um, a good one. It says there, are current, there is currently no profile filter to include exclude traffic using custom variables, mm. um, underscore set custom var. Now that set var has been deprecated, how can I exclude internal and dynamic IP traffic? Good one. Right, so we had something called set var, a user-defined variable. We've deprecated that from the tracking side in replace of these more powerful set custom var, custom variables. But we have a webinar coming up. You should watch on that about oh, yes. custom variables as well. So some promotion there. Um, so in the meantime, while we're waiting for profile filters to, to support the new format, you can use advanced segments. And exactly. then you can just segment it out, uh, slice and dice, and it should work for you. Yes, exactly. And, and actually, be, be, uh, when you run into these kinds of problems, explore the features that are available in mm -hmm. advanced segmentation because lots of dimensions and metrics are available that allow you to do things that you might otherwise have thought are not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we strongly encourage you. We both love advanced segmentation. Yeah, Without it, life is not complete. <laughs> Great, so question for you, Avinash, and this comes from uh, Melusine from Baltimore. Uh, site Overlayer was working for us until November <laughs> 2009. Uh, we haven't added anything new to our site in form of JavaScript and it cleared our browser caches. There's currently no overlay at all. How can we get this to work again? <laughs> I know that it's actually working. I was just <laughs> looking at my own website yesterday, so I do know that it's working. There's probably something unique about your website um, that is causing this issue. And typically, when you run into problems like this, we have four different methods in which you can get help. You can use the Analytics Help Center. There are, uh, there are articles that help you diagnose issues. You can use our Analytics Web Analytics Forum, um, and there you can post a question, and we have people mm -hmm. uh, from Google as well as other people from outside mm -hmm who are actually going to help you. That is our code site that helps you understand some of the nuances of these things, uh, where you can help, get help as well. And finally, of course, perhaps the best route for these kinds of complicated problems is that you get a GAC. We have, a, we have an army of fantastic, wonderful GACs that charge very reasonable prices compared to really all other webmatics providers. And um, they will be able to help you diagnose these issues. So you have four issues, some sort of self-help, some uh, external help or user help. Please use one of those uh, methods to find uh, help for yourself. And we're going to add all of those links yep. to this video um, so that you can solve these problems that come up to you. Great. OK. Um, so the next question is for you, Nick. Great. Um, another delightful question from um, Andy in Toronto, Ontario. Hello, Andy. Hey. Um, why do some pages show up under not set for content by title, even though they have page titles and appear in other areas in analytics correctly? This is an interesting question right there. It is. Um, so fundamentally, there's a property in the browser called document.title. And what we do is use that value when we send each request to analytics. And whatever that value is, we'll report on it. And it's strange because you know with URLs, every URL is unique. But for uh, the titles, you can have the same title across multiple pages. That's right. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one oh, mapping as you would think. I see, I see, I see. Right? I see. And in some cases, certain browsers, certain circumstances, we might not capture this value from the browser. And that's what's typically happening. So uh, what I would recommend is going back into the pages, trying to see, trying to maybe look at what were the browsers, what are the operating systems, try to isolate the, the challenge, the, you know, what was causing that. To, to better diagnose. So you were mentioned before, like sometimes in mobile phones, when it's being captured, it might not be coming out optimally or things like that. Right, right. 
But but let me let me also take this opportunity to pimp the async code, mm -hmm. because because sometimes if if um, the page doesn't finish loading completely and I already kind of move away, mm -hmm. Google Analytics or literally Omniture or whatever doesn't have time to capture all the data. Mm -hmm. But if 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 you Andy uh, switch to the async mode, you know it's kind of up there in the head and it works asynchronously. So your page is going fine, but actually Google Analytics collect data more accurately. Right. And so it's a feature that's only available in Google Analytics, and we strongly encourage you to switch to the async code mm -hmm. and see if that licks this problem for you. That's a great suggestion. Right? Yeah. Okay, question for you, Avinash, for Jens Bits from New York. Uh, I'm learning web analytics now and finding it daunting. I have <laughs> Avinash's book, okay, Yay. big fan, and they are helpful. That's good. So what is the best way to approach learning web analytics without getting spun around and around in numbers and reports? <laughs> so like, where do you begin? I know, it's, 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 a, it's a good question, Jen, and, and uh, um, it depends. <laughs> okay, but 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 let me let me tell you a, a fantastic way that I use to focus my attention uh, when I start web analytics, and and um, the the trick is uh, money, and and by that here's what I mean. The two places I will start my web analytics journey, regardless of what site I'm working with, large or small or otherwise, is the first thing is I focus on figuring out where is it that my company is currently spending money. So let's say we're running, you know, Nick and Nash Incorporated. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, okay, Nick, you know, you're, you're our VP of marketing. Where are you spending money? Mm -hmm. And Nick's going to tell me, well, we're doing some paid search. We're doing some email marketing and we're doing affiliate. Okay, that's great. That's exactly where I'm going to start. I'm not going to start with uh, referrers. I'm not going to start with organic search. I'm not going to start with any of those wonderful places, by the way. I'm going to say, where are we spending money today? And let me try and understand if I can reduce the amount of money we have to spend to acquire traffic. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to focus because any improvement that you do, any insight you find from analytics will help you reduce the acquisition mm -hmm. costs. So in this case, my VP of marketing is going to be happy. Mm -hmm. The second area I use to focus is how much money am I making and where and why not, right? All related to the outcomes from your website. And we got another question, outcomes, mm -hmm. that we're going to answer in a few seconds. But I focus on outcomes and say, okay, how much money am I making? Are people dropping off in the funnel? Um, why is it my conversion is not big? So, so those two sets of questions, where am I spending money and how much money am I making and why am I not making more money, really dramatically help you focus your attention initially and make sure in both cases you're working on things that add to your bottom line. So that's, that's the first filter. If you want to learn, the other, other recommendation I have is, let me, let me make two other recommendations. One is we've got our analytics forum that, mm -hmm. that people are always answering questions and, and pointing directions and all that stuff. But the other thing is, Nick mentioned a few minutes ago that we're going to do a webinar. Mm -hmm. And let me take a moment to promote webinars by all vendors, right? Google, um, Omniture does great webinars. Core Metrics, I think, from time to time. Not, not as much. Or Web Trends, not as much. Um, but at least Google Analytics and Omniture do webinars mm -hmm. quite frequently. Um, look up webinars that are done by these uh, companies because uh, these webinars will have 20% of pimping and telling you how great the vendor is. Uh, we do that too, and how much does it, and everybody does it. Um, but actually, many, most of the content, 80%, is actually very useful and a great way for you to learn because we'll bring best practices, we'll bring, and Omniture, mm -hmm. great best practices to you, and that's another great way to learn. So, so that's, that's kind of what I would do. Great, great answer. So here's another question for, uh, for you, Avinash. Um, this is from Leonard in Boca Raton. Wow, Florida. Yeah, when I send a larger date range, I see fewer page views or keywords in my report. Why is this true for some accounts while others roughly the same amount of transactions total correctly? Yeah, so Leonard, one, one of the things that happens is in, in Google Analytics, we want to give you the answer as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is if you pick really large date ranges, you know, three years or whatever, or, or, or depending on the amount of um, a number of visits and page views that you have on your website, what happens is it will automatically trigger sampling on your data. And what sampling does is it basically says, don't wait until tomorrow morning to get your answer. Yeah, right. Or for three years, like you might with some tools. Mm -hmm. We'll give you an answer very, very quick. I will statistically sample the data, give you the best possible answer will tell you the error margins and everything but when sampling happens on your data you can imagine that each time Google Analytics is intelligently processing in data and trying to find you the best possible mm -hmm. answer and and when you run the same report a couple different times or, or on number different number of days there might be slight variations because the number of rows that get picked to be sampled right. is actually a different one or slightly different and that really causes this issue to happen so if, if this is 
particularly egregious, normally it doesn't, it's a couple, two, three percent here and there, but if it's particularly egregious in your case, definitely reduce your time ranges mm -hmm. and, and use shorter time ranges. And that way, of course, A, you'll be sampling less data or m most likely sampling won't be executed right. and you'll get the answer that you're looking for. So those are two methods that you could use to overcome this problem. Great answer. Um, here's another one for you, Nick, this one. Okay. Oh, about our favorite motion chart. We, we did a music video on this. We should link to that. We'll link to the music video. <laughs> we have a music video. Really great. <laughs> um, what would be a good use of motion chart bar graph? I can easily see the use for the motion chart bubble graph, bubble charts, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a hard time finding use for the bar graph. That, that's a new feature we had introduced a little right. while back. Right, right. It's actually pretty nice. Um, so motion charts, you know, one of the biggest values that you can use with this is if you have a lot of different data, a lot of different metrics, you can plot four metrics at a time using colors, size, and X and Y axis. And you can play that over time. So through the normal reports over time, you'd have to actually select each one of them to see if there is a spike. But by putting them all together, you can quickly see if something's moving around a lot. You can tr time travel. Time travel through your data. It's right? amazing. It's, it's really, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely <laughs> like play with it because it's really interesting. Um, but sometimes when you have all these different bubbles going around, yeah, it, yeah. it becomes really noisy. Ah. And so one way to reduce the noise, right, because it's on a two-dimensional graph. So one way is to keep one of the axes, we constrain the x-axis, and so only the y-axis moves up and down. So if you wanted to I make see. it easier to analyze, you go into the bar chart and you just see what's going up and down. It might make the, the data a little bit more clear. Um, so uh, another question for you, Nick, uh, for e-commerce website that sells say more than 20 items, what is the best practice for using goals? Use them for products or categories. We'd love to hear your thoughts. It's from Mir in Israel. Uh, and uh, he also asked another question, which was best practice for using gold refinement. Um, any best practice? So Nick, uh, I know you've spent a lot of time in this area. Yeah, no, setting up goals is really important because you can get different funnel paths. You can tie everything to a conversion. Um, for e-commerce transaction sites, definitely on the final receipt page, don't only just make it as a transaction, but also make it as a conversion goal. We just recently released, released two uh, engagement type goals. One of them is time on site. So what you might consider if somebody spends more than 20 uh, minutes, more than five minutes even, yes, yes. there might be engaged customers who are really going through the shopping experience. They're not window shopping, they're going in the store looking at products. The other one to take a look at is pages per visit. The other one to take a look at is uh, for people who transacted, create a segment and look at what their average pages per visit. Most likely it will be much higher than people who didn't transact. What you could then do is set up a goal for that high level of pages per visit and then see how many people who came in could actually convert it, you know, most likely to actually purchase. That's great. So, and then we'll link to some articles that will yep. be helpful. I also want to say we got feature requests from Andy in San Diego, Pauline in UK, and uh, from Beekling in Neuchatel, Switzerland. So we'll pass those on to the product team, guys. Hope you had fun with this video and uh, please go to the Dory, uh, the moderator site and submit your questions. And we look forward to doing episode number eight. Yep. Thanks so much.